Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the meeting. This is what the council workshop from Thursday, March 16th, 2023. And the time is 3, oh, 3 p.m. And so at this point, though, uh, if there's any citizens who desire to address the council on any matter uh, listed on the workshop agenda, they sign up to do so uh, prior to this meeting. Has anybody signed up? Okay. Um, we're going to say if they did, that was easy. Yeah, fine. Uh, we go right into the uh, workshop top discussion. Uh, we'll look at the regular meeting agenda. Are there any items that uh, council would like to pull? Uh, open the discussion. Mayor Pro Tim, um, we have received a request from the um, applicant on mm -hmm. item number five, um, okay. requesting that we table the item. Um, he's uh, wrapping up the uh, engineering um, mm -hmm. items and would like a little bit more time before the council considers the item. Okay. Um, and then also since Mayor Davis isn't here, um, okay. I think we would uh, appreciate the full council being there. So we will be requesting that item number five be tabled tonight okay. as a request of the developer. Okay. And then we're going to just clarify this for the next meeting. So specific yeah. to the, the next meeting. For the next meeting. So okay. Okay. Any questions on that, council? Okay, we also had a request uh, to get more information on the item number eight, which is the 2023 rule 117 that's zero. The final reading on the um, consider adopting an ordinance designating approximately 194.7 acres of property uh, located at or near 4750 Wingland Road, Central Texas, which is a tax abatement reinvestment zone number 46. For commercial industry, industrial tax abatement. So we'll pull that one. Uh, well, Another option, um, mm -hmm. which I just thought of, is mm -hmm. if you would like me to go through the presentation today on first reading right now, oh. I, I can do that as well. That'd be a yeah. good thing. <laughs> okay. Well, if we have time, I think that'd be good. Okay. Um, that it's in. pretty short. Okay. okay. Let's, let's do that. I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would be in July. That's only the news. You have that relationship to number eight, too, right? It is. We're yeah. in the link to number eight on the regular agenda. Yeah. Also, on video, regular meeting number eight. And while we're doing that, on item number five, the item that's being postponed to the next meeting, it's got a public hearing attached to it. So I didn't know whether, what was the plan? Did we want to still conduct the public hearing or go ahead and postpone the whole thing and let the public? Maybe present you know at the beginning of the meeting. My recommendation is that we postpone the mm -hmm. the entire yeah. um, public hearing at six. So, so you may want to announce that at the top of the meeting. Okay. I think we got <laughs> so just as a refresher, um, Texas Tax Code Chapter 312 allows a city council to designate an area of the city as what's called a tax abatement reinvestment zone. Um, there are a couple of criteria that are required to be uh, met in order for this uh, type of reinvestment zone to be established including that um, the council believes that um, it would contribute to the retention or expansion of primary employment or that it would attract major investment within that zone and be a benefit to the property and contribute to the economic development of the city. Um, what, council can consider designating a reinvestment zone and then authorizing, so creation of the tax abatement reinvestment zone is um, required before um, a city council is um, is allowed to consider authorizing a tax abatement agreement with the company. And so um, you can do those things um, if the following criteria, if at least two of the following criteria are met, that the project involves a minimum increase in property values of 300% if it's new construction or 50% for the expansion of an existing facility that the project makes a substantial contribution to redevelopment efforts or strategic economic development programs. The project has high visibility, image impact, or is of a significantly higher level of development quality. 
um, that the project is in an area that might not otherwise be developed, that the project could serve as a prototype or catalyst for other developments of a high standard, that the project stimulates desired concentrations of employment or commercial activity, or that the project generates greater employment than would otherwise be achieved. So again, you just need to find that at least two of the following of those criteria exist um, to, be to be authorized to enter into a tax abatement agreement. Um, city staff has received an application from HEB to abate a percentage of the increase in taxable value of certain real property located at um, or near 4750 Winland Road, their existing distribution um, complex uh, campus. Um, so last meeting, um, you uh, had the first reading of the ordinance that would create the tax abatement reinvestment zone. This item, um, H on the consent agenda, is the second reading of that ordinance. Um, and so that would, um, uh, that second reading would then have that zone created. And again, then that would allow you to consider a tax abatement agreement for the following project. So um, HEB is uh, considering the expansion of its regional distribution center campus in Temple, um, including the frozen goods warehouse, um, but also considering other future phases of expansion. They uh, plan to invest at least 200 million um, in the construction and installation of improvements on their property and also create at least 100 new full-time jobs. Um, we do uh, believe that the project meets various uh, of the criteria that we went over earlier that are required for, again, you, you need to meet at least two. Um, we think it meets more than that. Um, and then we also believe that the project will expand the employment base, attract major investment, and contribute <laughs> to economic development as was required by Chapter 312. So that's what item um, H does. It's the second reading of creating the geographic um, designation, um, which is called a tax abatement reinvestment zone. And then that allows you to consider a tax abatement agreement, which is item number eight on the regular agenda tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions? Sounds like um, HEB is a good neighbor and expands 100 jobs. Sounds like good for the city. Any other questions? Anything? Okay, let's go on to our presentation. That is to have our Temple Library Master Plan uh, presented. Natalie. Hi. Thank you all for uh, entertaining us this evening. We have uh, the Library Master Plan to present to you all. We started work, we put out an RFP last fiscal year um, for a library master plan. And uh, Godfrey and Associates Incorporated was the agency that won that RFP uh, bid. And so they, we have spent about a year working together, uh, surveying the community, um, doing some uh, focus group meetings, some stakeholder meetings, and Tonight, this is the presentation of the culmination of all of that information put together with their recommendations on moving forward. You'll notice in this presentation, some of the data is going to refer back to some information from 2019 um, and some of our apples to apples comparisons with other libraries of similar sizes. And that's because that was pre-COVID and the state library requirements for 2022 or the statistics for 2022 have not been released yet by the state library. They haven't even been collected yet by the state library uh, for us to have access to. Um, so that was the last normal year that we have on record. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Brad Waters and he's going to be the one giving the presentation this evening on behalf of Godfrey's Association. Well, let's try this. So Godfrey's, we're a full service library consultant. Um, we do all types of libraries, but predominantly public libraries. We've done 26 or more in the state of Texas, including nearby Cedar Park and Round Rock. We, I think our master plan for Round Rock got them $20 million bond that they used to just now to build their new library that's still open up this year. Our team is, includes practicing librarians, consultants, and, and me as an architect. Um, you should know that after COVID now, the, all the libraries that closed during COVID uh, now reopened. So library outlets, service outlets in the United States now is at the highest number ever. So they're not going away, they're actually increasing in number. Uh, libraries are popular. A Gallup study right before COVID started that people go to the library twice as often as they go to almost any other leisure activity. 
Um, a study by the UT Graduate School of Business in 2017 shows that for every one dollar in, uh, invested in public libraries in Texas returns to four dollars and sixty four cents. So we all want that kind of return on our investment, but we get it. Uh, Demogra and I'm going to go fast because this is a one-hour presentation. We're going to squeeze into 15 minutes. Um, population and demographic data we used, uh, your the adopted uh, population forecast that the city, uh, I think, commissioned in 2018 uh, as our guideline for population. We also looked at U.S. Census uh, Bureau information for demographic data and compared you with the county, with the state, and with the country, and you're very closely aligned with, this, with the, the country, almost every everything that we see. Uh, the, as um, <clears throat> Natalie mentioned about the peer library analysis, we looked at 14 different communities of similar population, ranging from 74,000 to 150. We wanted to see into the future, as you grow, how you might compare with some of those larger communities. Um, and we did use the 2019 data uh, because there was incomplete data the next couple of years, and we don't have anything better than that. Uh, you rank better than average in terms of your total amount of space, in terms of square footage, your total expenditures per capita, uh, your collections are a little bit larger, your staff was better, and your number of visits by the public was better. You were below average in terms of staff salary and wages. We understand you've had a, a compensation study done since these 2019 uh, figures, so that may have changed now. Uh, circulation per capita was a bit lower than the peers, collection turnover, the how many, how often things are checked out was lower. Uh, program attendance and public computers were lower. Um, we did, as, as Valerie, as uh, Natalie mentioned, um, looked at uh, you know the community from a, an input standpoint. We had a, almost a thousand responses to our online survey. Uh, we had the six community and two staff focus groups. And we had nine one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews, which some of you were able to be a part of. Um, and one thing that we wanted to highlight here in the survey, we asked, would you be willing to raise your taxes for a library service? And as is typically the case, yes is always more than no, and depends is always more than anything else. So it really depends on the details. Uh, we know that nationwide, 70% of library bonds pass, and they usually pass at a, a, a vote of about 70% for yes. So it's just really a matter of a public uh, education campaign that turns those depends votes into yes votes. Um, looking at how you compare to Texas state public library standards uh, of the nine quantifiable standards, uh, you were you were missing or short of meeting the minimum in four of those. Uh, just barely missed the hours. Um, you're at 57 where 60 is the minimum. Uh, we are recommending you best practice you, you shoot to expand maybe up to four, maybe 72 hours at the long term. Um, in terms of staff, you are uh, above the minimum in both the uh, total number of staff, actually you're above the exemplary there and in, in between the two uh, guidelines in terms of uh, your, your accredited professional librarians. Um, now, what we're doing in this case, we as we presented this to staff, we ran across a couple of, of discrepancies. We've now, these numbers now compare um, in the, the 2014 standards, which is the last time they were updated with uh, your 2021 numbers. So that's where you stand. This is a much more or current uh, analysis. We also see that uh, from a staffing standpoint, you lack an, a, an assistant director position, which we recommend. Um, you, you're, you need more multilingual professional and paraprofessional staff and your professional development program of keeping people up to speed with what uh, is going on in the library industry is, is a little behind uh, normal. Um, we looked at the collections and here, um, you, it's one of the ones you fell short of meeting the minimum for the circulation. Uh, you're doing okay with the collection size and then the turnover, which is the circulation divided by collection is what the turnover number is because you're low on circulation, you're low on turnover. Um, from a finance standpoint, again, these numbers are based on 2014 standards. Uh, and so you, you've exceeded those standards, but we have not tried to, uh, uh, escalate your numbers or escalate this, the standards based on the consumer price index. So this is a little deceiving, um, um, but it is what it is. Um, there are no quantifiable standards for space in Texas. Uh, nationally, typically state standards have a minimum standard of 0.6 square feet per capita. A lot of states, including Louisiana and Delaware recently have adopted a 1.0 square foot per capita, and you're at 8.0. 
0.82 based on 21 population. Um, and this also uh, gives you credit for a space that you have not been reporting to the state library. I think you've only been taking credit for uh, the two floors and not all of the space in the building. So this would give you credit for that. Um, technology, again, you're, you're behind the curve on number of uh, computers per population. Um, and one of the things that you lack generally is, is better or state of the market uh, of technology applications. So we'll definitely want to address that in our, our recommendations. You've got great staff, uh, both from the professional and the paraprofessional levels. The programs and services that you offer are very good. The collections are, are, are good, but they could be better and you're in the, in the process of working on that. So our recommendations basically um, were based on our charge was to determine you know, if you needed additional facilities or resources, and if so, how we would provide equitable access to those. Um, you know, do you need to invest in new technology? Yes, you do. Uh, provide, we want to make sure you provide a level of service to everybody that meets the goals and policies of the city council, as well as the mission of the library. So the needs are preparing kids for school and college, uh, strengthen the employee base, and even maybe some small business incubation. Uh, continue to attract new residences built and, and businesses based on quality of life that the library helps improve and then increase income levels by doing all of those things. So in terms of access, as we talked about, we want to eventually get you know, up to and above the, the, the state standards um, that would require, well, we don't, wouldn't require, but it would, in order to serve the most number of people, it would be adding outlets in West, South and East Temple eventually over 20 year period. Uh, and then implementing access to all those facilities on a 24 seven unstaffed basis for people that will do shift work. They can't get to the library when the hours are open. Um, this has been being done now for about 10 years in Gwinnett County, Georgia and other places. So it, it's a system that works. <clears throat> um, in terms of locating facilities, um, when we typically survey clients for libraries, they say they wanna get to a library within 10 minutes. We did a study about 15 years ago in Fort Worth and there were 16 buildings there. There was an eight minute drive time to get to their library. Um, other places with more geographic barriers, it's longer. Um, but what we're suggesting is that you conduct, that you use data that the library has collected and given to your GIS and do a site selection study. That would be the next step for finding where you put these branches. And when we got to town, we heard the West, oh, the West, West is growing needed for the library in the West part of the temple. When I look at this heat map that the GIS has put together, it looks a lot more dense on the south side uh, than it does on the west side. So, you know, this is a visualization, but I think the next step is to actually confirm this. And so what we're saying is you would, let me just blow this up a little bit. You see the dots, the, the different colors represent different types of library users, whether they're checking out adult books or children's books or teen books. So it would give you a lot of information. Uh, we would suggest that you, you select locations not based on price, usually the land acquisition cost is a two to 8% of the total project cost. Do you want to go at, it, go at this like a business, pick the right location where you can get to the most number of people and to do a drive time polygon around yeah. that, let's say eight or 10 minutes and see how many of these dots fall within that drive time polygon. And that's how you go about selecting the best location to cover, get the best coverage. So you might do a, you do a South polygon, a West polygon, you do the, the downtown library and maybe even something in the east and say, OK, here's how we would cover what we have locations in each of these locations of libraries in each of these locations. Uh, from a service standpoint, again, just build on your strengths, keep doing what you're doing in terms of lifelong learning and STEAM, uh, early childhood education and teens and tweens, uh, workforce training, small business support, uh, I think is something that you could improve upon maybe in terms of partnerships with local entities as well. Um, and then you want to eliminate overdue fines. The cost to recoup that money is actually more than you get from the fines themselves. And the fines have shown to, to uh, exclude poor people and kids from using the library. So the American Library Association has put out a, a, a st statement saying that they are against the collection of overdue fines. You still collect for lost and damaged books. There are people who are still responsible for that, but fines aren't worth the money that, that it costs to, to collect. Um, collection standpoint, we'd like to reconfigure the shelves so they're lower and uh, more accessible from a wheelchair. So you see how all these two lower shelves have a tilt to them. So they're easier to read the spine, easier for somebody in a wheelchair to, to, to get those. Um, 
you would want to increase or maintain a size of your collection at two, two items per capita through, uh, through eternity at least. Uh, that includes electronic as well as print on paper items. And then you continue what you're doing in terms of, of weeding out the older books that are either technologically no longer sound or, or too worn or tattered. Um, in terms of technology, again, we want state of the market technology, things that people are used to seeing at home and in their offices, not state of the art. We don't need to go outside of that. But that includes uh, you know, increasing your opportunities for self-service. Um, the keys to this is that helps you with automation as well. And automation makes your staff more efficient. So um, the key to this is to upgrade your uh, integrated library system. This is your computer system. Um, and that uh, is something that is the core of your, your, your business. Once you do that, then you can implement RFID, which is if you're familiar, it's a tag toll, a toll tag for books. So now when I take my stack of books, I set them on the deal and brrr, it reads them all that fast and I'm in and out of the library. Or this, when they get checked back into an automated sorter, they go through a portal, they're checked into the system and automated portals, an automated system sorts them into the different bins and they go right up to the shelves much faster. So the turnaround of the books it gets back in the public's hands much faster. Um, we also wanna see better uh, technology in your meeting rooms. Uh, and we need more meeting rooms and study rooms of all sizes, what you have now. Um, again, mobile technologies, uh, loaning laptops, uh, template, uh, tablets, hotspots, or even uh, uh, chargers to use in the library or to take home. This has been done now for over 10 years uh, with very little loss or damage. Um, the other thing it does is it allows you then to uh, check out a laptop in the library, sit anywhere I want to use it. We use the Wi-Fi, and I don't have to have as many desktop computers. So that's a smaller footprint. I can, I can convert some of those single users to collaborative stations with very high-end software. So now I can train people on for job skills on some really expensive software that most people can't afford at home and a lot of small businesses can't afford uh, a startup. Um, facility standpoint, we're talking about a 20-year plan where you would establish and try to achieve that one square foot per capita standard. So one would be to modernize the downtown library. Uh, obviously that building is designed in 72 as a bank and has been solely turned into a library, but it was it's, it's a lot of times you've moved into spaces that already existed. And so it's not as efficient use of space. So we're talking about trying to open up the, the building by taking down walls and, and visual impediments so the staff can see things more clearly and supervise from a limited number of, of, uh, of service points. We want to look at some new li branch libraries, again, east, west, south, um, Potentially, maybe maybe the East gets a modular modular kiosk like you see here. So it has Wi-Fi. I can it's got a it's got I swipe my library card. I can see the catalog on the screen. I can check out books from here. I can return books here. I can order books here, and it'll tell me, okay, we'll, we'll deliver your book in one day, two days. You come back and get the book. Mm -hmm. So it's a very inexpensive way to put a a pot, you know, pilot project uh, outlet in a, a smaller area. Um, we definitely recommend you construct all new libraries as single story buildings because they're less expensive to operate. When you compartmentalize a library, you have to staff each compartment. So when you put space on two floors, you have to staff two floors, even if nobody's up on the second floor. So any new building, we want to see them done on single floors. And I can point to you a number of new buildings and library buildings in Texas, multiple floors that have cost their clients much more to operate than they would have to have if they were on a single floor. Um, in new facilities, that 20 year one square foot per capita, the next steps would be to draft a building program document is basically the uh, design specifications for any new or renovated building. So it really makes a lot of decisions with the library staff before you hire an architect, you hand them that building program, which they're going to want anyway, and it gives them everything they need to know to design that library. Um, we talked about building the uh, beginning the site search. Again, we're looking for a 35,000 square foot footprint, which you would grow into over time. Uh, if ideally, you build that 35,000 shell to start with and finish out as much as you could afford and gradually grow into it. The extra space in the meantime could be used by other city functions or even leased out. Um, and then considering uh, repurposing another building for the archives collections. Uh, we've looked at a couple of those uh, possibilities in town. In terms of the downtown library, you know, modernize, reconfigure the space, uh, make it easier to supervise. 
at a main entrance off of Adams Street. So it's more visible from the street. As you can see, this is where you enter in the library, uh, open up the space. Again, like I talked about, um, we want to add a 5,000-pound uh, staff service elevator on all, all four floors so that if I needed to bring in a stretcher in for an emergency, I could get a stretcher in and out uh, with no problem into an ambulance. And then we want to resolve any code issues we have. So there's a, a rendering we did. So this would be a this new round entrance on uh, Adam Street here first there that would definitely say in you know Timba Public Library right out on the street. Um, we look at that. We've laid out the space actually. With, I'm going to go forward once and come back. We've actually laid out the shelving so we know what the capacity of the seating and the shelving is, and that's what these blocks represent. So blue is adult. There's a glass wall that separates the blue and the red from the child. The red is the children's. Green is staff workspaces. We have a library cafe at the front door, it uses the outdoor seating, uh, brand new restrooms in that new uh, round lobby. And we extend the lobby at the top out to include that stair down to the basement garage. So we've solved the problem you have there now. Um, and then, I'm, so here you can see just how the shelling lays out. So again, from circulation desk, I can see this way. I've got a service desk here for the kids as they come through the glass partition, story time room, learn and play room. Uh, staff uh, everywhere. So this would be kind of a that story time room in the back with a kind of a streetscape of little houses and playhouses for the kids to play and sit down and read a book. Um, second floor, again, wide open space. We've eliminated the existing elevator in the middle of the atrium. I mean, now the whole building is library. So the secure perimeter is at the, you know, once you come in the door and the two elevators that, existing, that, are, that are existing uh, from the original design are, are adequate. But here we've added this fourth, this service elevator. So it always backs into a staff workspace. Um, top floor, we've reinstituted the racetrack corridor. So the two fire stairs are connected now with no dead ends. Um, we've put the friends here adjacent to the meeting room for their book sale purposes. We've actually expanded the meeting room and we will put in um, modular dividing walls to be able to separate that to three separate spaces. So you wouldn't have to just have the one big room in the main room that you do now. But that top floor now becomes genealogy, local history, and pretty much staff uh, support services and uh, staff administration. So from a staffing standpoint, uh, you just would need to add a very few uh, positions at the top of the org chart, assistant library director and branch managers as those buildings come online. You definitely need to retain the people you have um, and, and hire some additional paraprofessionals that then the library, the professional librarians can delegate to and make their uh, you know, kind of spread that, that span of control uh, and certainly retrain and, re and hire any new multicultural staff you need to for uh, your current and future population. Um, from a finance standpoint, again, we want to uh, make sure that we meet or exceed the state standards as we might escalate those into the future. Um, um, look at additional sustainable revenue streams. Um, Besides just local uh, local support, you had a very high percentage of local support higher than almost all the other um, other peers. So you definitely want to look at some ways to do more private fundraising. We'll get to that here in a second. Um, we've set a goal for about thirty two, thirty three dollars per capita over the over the next ten years, getting up to that point. Um, and that should be enough to staff at least one and maybe two new branches. Um, again, one recommendation we have is that the library foundation become active, that they actually hire staff to do uh, the development work. So they have full-time staff, at least one or one and a half persons to go out and are constantly uh, trying to raise money so that you can get that private money number up to maybe 10% of your total uh, operation costs. Um, and again, looking at other ways, all sorts of uh, out of the box ways of of uh, revenue generation, such as crowdsourcing and grants and things like that. And then we, we definitely recommend uh, that you deal with four different school districts that you coordinate any kind of future bond elections so that you're not all going out and asking for money at the same time. Certainly you'll, you'll partner with those schools and that should be uh, a part of that. Um, so from a marketing standpoint, continue to do the excellent job your marketing people are doing. Um, we're saying that you know that requires that the library keep uh, a, Finger on the pulse of the of their population of their res their, their resident uh, users um, on an annual basis, and there's actually a platform that from the Public Library Association PLA uh, that they could use uh, that helps them determine 
how, what the outcomes of that they're achieving with their their uh, services. So with that, I will ask, answer any questions you have. If anything. Any questions? Jennifer? These are three satellites, one single story libraries. Over time, yes. So if you set the 1.0 square foot per capita, as you grow, that, that, that gives you the target for when you would add another library. Um, right now, you've got 72, 74,000 square feet across the street, which is the best way, right? Um, uh, so, and you're at what, you're almost you're almost getting close to 100,000, or 86 or something now. Um, so that would be, you know, to stay ahead of the curve, try to get to the 1.0 and then stay ahead of it as you grow. And then before that, you would recommend doing the, Kind of like a little library kiosk sort of thing. Is that that's um, a if you want immediate uh, immediate response, that's a three hundred an ex exterior one like that's a three hundred thousand dollar investment. It can be picked up and moved when you want. Normally move. a two day turnaround time. It that's could be easy. faster. It just depends on it you know, depends on how how big you get. Um, you can get a bigger either it's modular, so you can add modules. So again, it can give you more books, and that's a faster turnaround time. It does take, you know, going to their staff, going and picking out sure. folks and putting in. Um, Susan, you have any thoughts? Um, would you go back two slides to the um, okay. budget ish question or points? You'll see in the report we've actually mapped out the ten year budget. Okay, um, you um, probably am wrong about the number. There, there was a number. That you there this one increase over budget to thirty. What are we now per capita? Um, well, I can give you the twenty twenty one. Was that twenty something? Twenty four. Yeah, twenty twenty four. So 20. versus thirty two seven four. You'd probably I say more like thirty three would would round it up to thirty. Okay, so from thirty from twenty four to thirty three in ten years, give or take. Yeah. Oh, this is in ten years yeah. to go to that. Okay. And, and you'll see a chart in your master plan okay. in, the, in the recommendation section to show you how to get there. Okay. Good. And I apologize. I didn't explain with what I handed out. This is the actual plan at Charles and Means. Uh, this is the appendix that has um, all the different charts and graphs. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No, I think when you, later well, night when you think of something, write it down and at least forward to it. Yes, sir. Quick questions. One of your first slides showing data, per capita data, and you mentioned where we sit uh, in terms of as a, compared to the average, where the, it was right after you showed the peer cities. And I was curious whether the whether that those statistics were compared to the peer cities or just overall for the state of Texas. Um, or, or nationally, yeah. The early, so early on, it's probably around ten. It so <laughs> if it's in here, then this is with yeah, the state earlier, standards. Earlier okay. Than that. So yeah. um, then it would be here. These are the, against the peers. So this is 2019 data. Yeah. So it's the benchmarking. So it's compared to the other cities. The yes. list of other cities yeah. that you showed, not and, just. And again, there's a the detail you'll see in the in the in this version the detail of that all the statistics. Um, it's pages and pages of data. Yeah. You mentioned um, beefing up the library foundation to be more fundraising. Um, what if my my inclination is that the different entities around in Temple that are fundraising are circular, like the same. So go to the same organizations and get every organization is hit up continually. How and you you made the relationship to our peer cities. Do those cities have foundations and how are those foundations reaching beyond the cities to raise money beyond the same givers continuously? That's a, it's a great question. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know that we looked specifically at which of those cities have foundations, but I'll get that information for you. Um, I can tell you that again, the foundations that are most successful hire staff. They use volunteers as the board to direct the staff and hold the, the staff accountable. But the foundations that just use volunteer labor burn out and then they, they fizzle out. Um, again, the peer information you'll see when it goes look at local versus state and private fundraising, 
they're all in the 10 to 15 percent range where you're at like one or two. The friends are doing a great job for what they do. They're both sure, great. Right. Sure, they're not fundraising. You're right. I mean, they're not. They're not. They're they not geared. Not yeah, yeah, totally different way. But how how do you suggest that the friends go beyond Temple? Do other entities not, not, get money not, from not, elsewhere? Not the friends, the foundation. I'm not yeah, the foundation. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, right. sorry. Yeah, that's it. You just look. I mean, they're 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 they're, in, they're nationwide or even international uh, grants. So if you find, hire a person who is in development, who that's their okay. their calling. Uh, they'll they'll know exactly where to do and where to go. I would you know if you've got a McLean room, I'd be my first. I'd drive up to Waco and say, "Where's Mr. McLean?" Uh, I don't know who or I've not met him or anything else, but I you know. Well, he's hit up by every I'm, every I'm organization sure. in Temple Continuous. I'm sure you already have. You already yeah, he's have. Well, I see his name on the screen. He lives here, and he's very very generous. Um, to the community at large. Well, and, you know, we can we can touch on all the things the library does. I'm sure he'd be even more generous. <laughs> and I, I will mention, um, as a staff, we've put together a list of foundations that provide um, uh, funds to 501c3 as nonprofits. Um, we just can't get it because we're not a 501c3 nonprofit, um, but with the activation of the foundation. So they would be an agency that could reach out to those organizations Good. that provide yes. funds within either the state or a region that we're part of. And we have a consultant who is specifically geared towards fundraising. If you did want to move forward with that, we help you out with that. Okay. Very expensive. Very Thank good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. I just real fast, okay. I don't think I had a chance to say thank you to Natalie. Uh, the winter brunch was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Definitely enjoyed it. I took my son, a 24-year-old son, with me, and he was very impressed that you used technology. We all had to download an app and we played a game, and it was it was a lot of fun. So cool. thank you for doing that. I think it was a good turnout. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I hope so. The food was delicious. I I know I left. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Absolutely, I appreciate it. Thank you. Did a great job. Thank you. Okay, we're going to hear from Liz Herwick. All right, so we're back with the Boards and Commission's annual report. This will be the second report for this cycle. As you know, two years ago, y'all passed a new Boards and Commission's policy, and as part of that policy, you see these presentations once a year. So within this presentation, I'm going to give you some details about what's expected of your board report, which is sitting in front of you. Also, some uh, stats from the last year of these Boards and Commissions, and also report highlights. Now, your Boards and Commission's policy said that annually, the City Council must receive a report of each board that details the activities for the past 12 years, their response to the goals, and their future goals, as well as an attendance. It just so happens um, earlier this year, oh, sorry, the annual report shall contain, and you'll see it for every single board that's in here, a cover letter signed by their board chair, um, a summary of the activities that they did the last 12 months, a response to any of their goals or work plans that they set last year, as well as additional recommendations for future goals and also that summary. Um, it just so happens earlier this year, I was scanning all of the library board minutes and around 1936, 1937, when uh, the city of Temple actually took over the library board, um, you can see here that annual reports are nothing new to the city. Um, there is the um, attendance roster from 1937 library board. Here is the annual report that the um, library president gave as well as this little snippet that I found in the minutes um, reminding the city commission that they had some vacancies on the library board that they needed to appoint new members. So I thought that was a neat little thing I stumbled across since we're given this report and the library board is in here. So again, um, your board reports come twice a year and they're based on when the board members are appointed in both April and October. So for our April appointees inside your um, binder here, will be the following eight boards. Just a few little statistics I think is interesting. Again, just for the eight boards that are reporting this cycle, there were 70 board members, 100 board meetings were held, and the most meetings by one board was 54. That's the Main Street Advisory Board that includes their four subcommittees as well. Nonetheless, that's a lot of meetings and a lot of volunteer hours and staff hours that go into um, these boards and commissions. 
So getting into the meat of each board, again, your booklet is going to have more in-depth information. This is just the highlights from each board. The Building Standards Commission met four times. They heard 17 cases. 10 orders to demo were handed out by the board and seven orders to secure. Um, the board's goal is to look at placing liens for demo using city funds. And if you'll remember last year, they looked into this using CDBG funds. The Development Standards Advisory Board only meets as needed. It just so happens they did not meet at all last year. However, their future goals when they meet again is to elect a chair, approve this annual report, and also approve a proposed plan of work and hold quarterly meetings. The Historic Preservation Board has been very active. They were one of the longer reports you'll find in your book. Um, they received and discussed preservation information, created and improved a new heritage marker application and design, also uh, approved the new local historic landmark designation application marker design, and recommended to council a new historic district, the African American Churches Historic District. Um, they are currently working on a plethora of activities, which includes um, promoting new historic sites. They already have three benchmarked, uh, 508 South MLK Drive, the Bird Creek Indian Battle Site, and the MKT Depot's um, Texas Historic Landmark designation. They also want to distribute more education material um, by holding public information meetings where they will get the word out about best practices, uh, code compliance, um, permitting and standards of historic houses and homes and sites. Um, they're also looking at amending chapter 17, which is very important as they are continuing in their process of becoming a certified local government designation through the Texas Historical Commission. And finally, they're also working um, in reviewing historic preservation as part of the Unified Development Code as that is in the process of being reworked. Moving on to the library, they approved, if you'll remember last year, they were reviewing just a ton of different policies from the bulletin board policy to the meeting room policy, checkout policy. So they have approved all of those new policies um, they're reviewing current marketing and outreach and, of course, took part in the library master plan discussion, which you saw just earlier today. And in the future, they want to continue to expand on their marketing, um, review customer service feedback, and then also really dive into that library master plan. The Main Street Advisory Board, again, they were chosen. Uh, they were last year and again this year as an accredited program of Main Street America. As part of their accreditation, they have to follow this national uh, Main Street Program trademarked four-point approach, which is where they get their subcommittees, uh, promotion, design, economic vitality, and organization. The board that you will see in here has developed a very comprehensive uh, set of goals. I think there's 41 set of goals. And then in the new year, they're looking at developing more forward-looking goals and a work plan. So for this section of the report, I just broke it down into the four subcommittees. The Economic Development or the Economic Vitality Committee really brainstorms all the vacant buildings downtown uh, and trying to get businesses into those. Um, they really focus on recruitment, retention, expansion. And these businesses li listed here are either new or expanded businesses within the last year to downtown Temple, which is the Chalk Community, Lena Lane Boutique, Wick and Burn, uh, Chupacabra Gym and Hat Trick Sports Bar and Soccer Training Center. The design committee is looking at construction projects in downtown Temple. Um, they received reports for both Transformed Temple and Neighborhood Services. And also they really focus on the beautification, the cleanliness, the safety and construction of the downtown properties. The promotion uh, committee really acts as a catalyst to help promote the different uh, events that are happening downtown. Um, First Fridays is one of their big things that where all the businesses get together, but this committee really helps to promote those as well as all the various downtown promotional events that happen. 
And then the organization committee sponsors a historic building photo contest um, every year during National Preservation Month. I believe that's going on right now. So if anybody has any photos of historic downtown, get with Dan and get those submitted. Um, they also hosted their third annual Imagine the Possibilities Tour. I think they had 26 different sites this year that the public could go and tour and look at both um, existing businesses, place for future businesses, and they also host a business after hours reception. The Neighborhood Revitalization Advisory Board really focused on their goal of love where you live. They um, provided feedback for the um, new planning districts, as well as reviewed and provided feedback on the Homelessness and Mental Health Strategies Plan, um, provided input on the Neighborhood Leadership Academy and the Home Maintenance Academy. And they'll continue to support um, these areas with kickoff events, with public forums, and um, canvassing. The Parks and Recreation Board also had a lot of internal reports for the various um, events Parks and Recs puts on, like the Christmas Parade and the Little Bit of Blooming, which this year is turning back into the big blooming. Um, and then they also recommended to council uh, various rates. Uh, also on the Beyond the Bend Master Plan, they heard staff biographies and division updates. One of the goals of this board is to look into perhaps creating a subcommittee that could help with their capital improvement projects. Uh, our last board is the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Again, they only meet as needed. They met twice during the reporting year and they granted three variance requests. And that is all I have until the next cycle, which will be in September for those appointments October 1st. I encourage you to read the full report. The board put in a lot of effort to creating a lot of these and creating their own goals that they can work towards. And lastly, I just want to publicly thank the board liaisons and the board staff um, and department heads who facilitate these boards. Do y'all have any questions? No question. I have a question, but I have a comment. I just want to be sure that Jason knows about historic preservation pictures. He does. Good. Yes. He's a great photographer. And in fact, uh, just coincidentally, my update ties in very nicely with with Liz's update. And, right. and there's a picture of Jason in there. Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure that he knows. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm just amazed when I look at the pictures of how many people in our community are involved in making our city what it is. So we really want to say thank you to the staff and all the uh, volunteers that are part of such a simple what it is. It's just amazing. I just want to add to that. When Graham came up with a lot of these ideas, some of us on council moaned and groaned and said, oh, you've got to be kidding. It's never going to work. We'll never get that many people. You were so right and we were so wrong. And it's so good to have so many residents so interested and things happening. Okay. Yes, I just talk. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it makes everybody feel good that they can see some of the work. It's not in vain, but it's going to happen. Okay, we have now the uh, presentation from the VSA Sports LLC regarding the sports facility audit and destination marketing strategy. Aaron. You know, uh, first thing helpful, fabulous day. We have Don here. You can see him on the video up there. Um, Mr. Walker, he is with BSA Sports. Um, for the past several months, I've been working closely with our Parks and Recreation Department as well as Communications and Marketing on um, the sports facilities audit as well as the destination marketing strategy. So. Um, Don is from out of state, so I'm glad that he was able to um, come today. He, he actually um, presented to the Parks Board, I think, last week. And then we had a, a long workshop afterward um, from staff to, to work on things. So he's going to present to you today um, all of the recommendations that he's come up with in the hope to increase sports tours in the temple. Thanks. Well, thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. And I presume you folks can hear me. Is that correct? You can hear me all right? Yes, uh, just, yes. 
Okay, good. I just wanted to check. Uh, it's pretty warm here in Cincinnati, but not as warm as uh, what I enjoyed in Temple a few days ago. Uh, folks, I've spent the last 42 years in sports tourism. I've run facilities, bid on events, produced events, uh, created a sports commission, led the National Association for 25 years, and I've consulted with now hundreds of cities and counties. And uh, it's been a delight. And it's fun because every time I go into a new community, I meet more interesting people, fun people, people that are dedicated to doing the best they can in their community. Uh, let's take a look very briefly at what we were up to the last few months. Next slide. We conducted a sports facilities audit where we examined all the tournament quality facilities in the city and we also got over into Belton a bit. Uh, we also created a destination marketing strategy and as Aaron mentioned, we had a workshop a few days ago designed to get that process started. And we also looked at some of the competitive marketing policies and practices of communities like Round Rock, Bryan College Station, Waco, and a number of other communities in your uh, immediate area. Next slide. We were sure we were going to be taking a very close look at the first phase of Crossroads. And let me say right now, Crossroads, the way it stands right now, if there were more fields, the, it is exactly what tournament directors are looking for. Those of you that were involved with it, kudos to everybody. It's a beautifully designed park and obviously you have thoughts about improving and expanding it over the coming years. We considered the master plan that's been produced. We looked at other tournament quality venues within your community and visited those sites. We interviewed a whole bunch of key stakeholders from the Parks and Recreation Department, Marketing and Communications, other people within city government, and of course, uh, a plethora of people involved with the local sports organizations. Next slide. If you're going to be successful in sports tourism, a community needs the suitable facilities there, and one of the reasons people are interested in this is the growth in sport tourism. Uh, it's been recently estimated that in the United States, sport tourism is now producing just over $40 billion a year in direct visitor spending. And it's proven to be both recession and pandemic resistant. Very quickly in 2019, the industry set its high water mark. In 2020, of course, there was a major dip. But what's interesting is in 2021, 90% of the loss was recovered. 90% of the loss was recovered. That's how quickly the sports segment bounces back uh, when it has the opportunity to do so. There's been a tremendous growth in new facilities across the country. You're not alone in building fields. It's happening everywhere. You need accommodations, the right kind of hotels, and you do. You need some things in the area for people to see and do, and you have that. And you've got some dedicated local event producers, the soccer, baseball, softball, and other organizations that know what to do, where to go, and where to get teams. Next slide. You're already hosting sports events that bring visitors to town. One of the things you will hear me say twice is this, one of the big secrets is you're already doing events, so let's get more of those teams from far enough away that they can't get home tonight and they'll sleep in your hotels. There's an issue at Crossroads. You need to know about it. Practices and games are wearing those fields. We recommend that you no longer allow practice to take place at Crossroads. Have all your practices for baseball, softball, soccer, and other sports in other locations in the city. There'll be some pushback on that, but it's important that you do that to preserve, 
preserve those wonderful fields and especially let the soccer fields continue to establish themselves. Everybody wants to be at the new facility, obviously. Temple grades out well as a host city. And some of your older fields and diamonds like uh, Coram Pie or Mercer, uh, those are still usable facilities, but they could use some upgrades. And that's something PARD is well aware of. Next slide. Uh, in the destination marketing strategy, and we're not gonna go through this, uh, we've got three phases. Uh, and the first phase is crawl. The second phase is still crawl. And the third phase is begin to walk a little bit. Uh, we have a, a, a voluminous report that addresses all these issues. And I don't think I need to go through, through them all today. Your existing marketing materials based on the existing Discover Temple templates work fine. And all they need is some sports customization. And I want to assure all of you, we've already done a work session where we've talked about mission and vision and goal setting and plans to meet each one of those goals and way to track progress every year. It's all been done. Next slide. Focus on events taking place. Don't commit to local events until outside events are set. What that means is that if you get an opportunity to bring a, an event in that will have a significant number of visitors, those events are gonna be scheduled more than a year out. There are, work is in progress with marketing and communications and parks and recreation to work out a system where the out of town events can be booked far enough in advance that they won't interfere with local events. And there'll be more to come on that in the coming months. But we wanna emphasize visiting teams and focusing on statewide events. Younger age groups have more people traveling with them than older age groups. The sweetest spot in all of sport are 12 year old girls. First of all, people wanna travel more with girls than boys. And secondly, more people travel with them and more family and friends come along. And don't forget the other segments of the travel industry while you're building up your sports tourism business, because sports travelers spend less on average than regular tourists because they're trying to conserve resources to make multiple trips in a year. Next slide. Manage expectations. Go slowly. Be very deliberate. The competition you're facing in your immediate area has been at it for a long time. You can't overcome a slow start in any other way than gradually. So manage expectations. You're looking at two or three years down the road for significant events, but be assured that the planning that resulted in crossroads resulted in exactly what tournament operators are looking for. Turfing some or all of each one of those fields at crossroads is an intermediate step before the master plan might be executed. Because if you did say turf the infields, which is very common these days for softball and baseball, you could practice there and would not have to restrict those fields to competition only. Uh, we provide the math in the report that shows how a 50 team softball event with about 40 teams from out of town and 10 staying at home each night could spend as much as $500,000 over a three day weekend uh, in lodging, food, beverage, and souvenirs and so forth. So four or five of those, and you're quickly in the two to $3 million in estimated direct visitor spending, all of which gets taxed. And when you do expand Crossroads, you'll do it based on all the things you've learned over the last two, three, four years. That's it. That's a real quick run through. And I know you don't have time for very many questions and discussion, but I'll sure answer anything that might come up. Any questions? Yeah, Don, you said a hotel. Um, 
with that is there any specific size that you recommend uh no it's what the hotelier thinks is appropriate uh it's it's really important to you know it might be 85 to 100 rooms depending but there isn't a magic number for a hotel a new hotel it's what the hotelier thinks you've got a good collection of hotels right now did you have a specific site or generalized site in mind for a hotel no not specifically but it sure would be nice to see some uh, commercial activity in the area of crossroads uh there is land out there obviously and uh, someday somebody's going to build restaurants and hotels out there uh, that would be ideal, but uh, in the meantime, as close to the major thoroughfares as possible. And that, that is all with our existing fields, or is that... Um, I'm sorry? You, well, I guess, do you think that we would be able to, uh, in two to three years, the revenue you said, I think it's, did you say 500? Thousand per yes, with existing fields, what you've got now, you can okay. do that with what you've got. Okay, but question for Kevin what does it cost to turf a field? Do you have a ballpark? Uh, I, I don't remember the uh cost. I want to say back when we built Crossroads, it was maybe close to a million a field, I believe. Uh, but if you like what uh what he was mentioning, if you do just the infill, uh, typically where you have the dirt, that's what causes your rain delays or rain outs, uh, which would bring down the cost. If you, the more you do of that, you also can start eliminating like the mowing, those type of- uh, Saving uh, operational costs. Right. And then the other advantage you have, you know, water is a, a scarce commodity someday. So the more you turf, then the less water you use. Uh, now, turf is not going to last forever. It's maybe eight to 10 years or so, something like that. Then you'd have to replace it again, but we would have to run the numbers uh, again. One of the things that uh, Kevin and I have had the chance to talk about some of these things, obviously, and one of the things you you begin to realize, if you, if you would turf, for example, most of the soccer fields at once, they wouldn't all cost a million dollars. Uh, there, are, there is a tremendous savings in multiple fields at one time on the same location. And Don, we have that tennis, um, that, the tennis facilities out there. Does tennis bring in any money? Tennis can, but I think um, to be fair about it, you have a recreational tennis facility. And to turn that into a tournament facility requires it being the home base for all the players within, I don't know, close to 50 miles. And there are some tennis clubs in the immediate area and that already exist because you need at least three to four times as many courts and you need a stadium court, clubhouse. Uh, it's a, there's a lot to it. Okay. Don, what about pickleball? I mean, I realize it's not in the category of, of the things you're talking about, but we do see it growing in some ways. No, oh, pickleball is huge, huge. Here in Cincinnati, we're building 30 pickleball courts down on, by the Ohio River in the floodplains so that when the river comes up every year, it won't hurt it. But that's just one example. My goodness, there, are, there is a National Pickleball Association now in a sanctioning body with the appropriate rules and regulations, it's the biggest, fastest growing sport in the United States. So it, so it, it could be bringing in money also. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So my understanding was to add some pickleball cords, not to the, you know, that tennis facility. That is one of the... Um, Kevin's priority in uh, space, places and spaces, the IP that will bring forward, the first round of projects that will bring forward for consideration soon. Okay, next meeting. Mm -hmm.
I have to admit, uh, Don, that I never heard of pickleball until about six months ago. I mean, I must live on another planet. But I went to my gym on a Saturday afternoon. It's usually red or and I couldn't park. They were pickleball competition. Uh, I am uh, presently doing a little bit of work with folks in Columbus, Georgia, and they will shortly have 35 pickleball courts. Well, we're behind the times. Well, Don't fret about being behind. Be deliberate about getting more involved with sport tourism. Uh, don't rush. Take it easy. The business is going to be around for the foreseeable future, and there's no sense in rushing, rushing, and making mistakes. Anybody can buy events. You want to build events. Okay. Great report. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's really Thank you. Appreciate your attention. All right. Uh, we'll move on to um, receive the part more updates from the information technology and planning development. All right. Uh, so first I did cover org charts. There haven't been many changes. I have filled some spots, but um, the org itself is still the same. Um, accomplishments for Q3 and 4. Um, we have added some more. And it, it sounds like, and Dana, for, for all you, sounds like that I'm behind and I am because this is Q3 and 4. So some of these things that uh, you may say, well, we've already done that. Yes, because it's been in three and four. Um, my next one will be up, caught up, so it'll be present. Um, so PrimeGov, we added some boards and commissions. Uh, my government online, we changed um, meter costs and worked on improving workflows. Dayforce, we did a major upgrade, uh, major release. Same thing with Navaline and RedTrack. Uh, we installed Cameras at Hillcrest, um, our construction projects, which I'm sure you all are very familiar with, and then some miscellaneous projects. Uh, we manage the right Verizon bill for the city. Um, cell phones, devices get swapped around quite a bit, so every once in a while we try to do reconciliations, and this quarter we reconcile with parks and solid waste. Um, we're working on upgrading the police department from iPhones to Androids to prepare for our new records management software. So we've just deployed our first few phones. Did it only work on Android? Interesting. Another reason I can't be a police officer. Finalized negotiations on our niche contract, um, and we completed our cyber security training and reported back to the state. That was the uh, training that y'all got to listen to a few months ago, um, and completed our organization changes and additions. Kelly, wait, 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 wait. Is that Would you remind us what, what is niche? That is the police records management. Oh, program. right. That's the, um, the regional. So we're replacing mm -hmm. our um, old software that is really in for, won't be supported much longer and is really not mm -hmm. very efficient at all. And we were able to develop through um, a lot of hard work uh, from, from Chief Reynolds and, his, and I think Alan actually led the, the project um, to develop the consortium with pretty much every law enforcement agency in Bell County and some, I think, I think Copper Cove too. And so we will be the host of that, uh, that system, but all of the law enforcement agencies will be on the same platform, which should um, be really fantastic in terms of efficiency and sharing information and emergency response. And um, I honestly, you know, you said I was crazy earlier about the board and commission. I d did not see, did not think I would see that actually come to fruition. And so that's that's a huge deal. But now Kelly and her team have a full plate to get it implemented. So yeah. we'll we'll have every law enforcement agency in the county shortly after it launches. It's so important with emergency. Yeah. I mean, we remember obviously remember 9/11 and the Powers and the fire radios. And also crime analysis, you know, so you I think that that is probably even the more significant um, element that um, you know you 
each agency will be able to seamlessly share information, which I think that will help solve it much faster than it than the current very siloed um, software. And when will it be launched? Uh, we're looking at 24. Uh, March. March of 24. March, April. So like share that you a year. Mm -hmm. And we've already been yeah. working on it for a good 15 months. Yeah. What is interesting about the system we selected is that the state attorney general's office is actually looking to uh, possibly buy a niche system as well and start doing almost like a consortium like we did, but do it with all the smaller agencies around the state of Texas um, to give them the technology that we're going to enjoy. But one of the other aspects of that is, is that they call they have a program within niche called InterNiche where we can do MOUs and basically we could tap into that, those others and see what's happening all around the state. So if we have a, a someone here in Temple that we're dealing with that may live in Amarillo, we may be able to draw data from that to help us work our cases. So um, that's on the very front end, but I know the attorney general is looking at it. A lot of possibilities. Uh, new applications that we have implemented, 15.5 for weekly reports, and VIX for Jenna to post agendas. Uh, Switch complied, it's a two-part um, implementation. It's FOG and then FACLA, we finished the FOG piece. Uh, we renewed our Microsoft licenses and we included some security software for email. Uh, GIS has been updating the LumenFest maps and did some uh, data updates to Chameleon, which is our animal control software. Uh, in my last presentation, I showed you the Hillcrest map and the Crossroads map before it was actually live. Um, they're both live now. Um, and the new maps, we created and printed map books for um, um, Kenton's team, and it was just before the storm, so it was perfect timing, <laughs> just in time. And then the library heat map. That How are the better. Crossroads maps? Kevin, are you still getting people complaining the test ports? Uh, we no, not the reservations. We get uh conflict between uh tennis and pickleball players. Uh, so but that's why I, I moved that to pickleball uh item. But in terms of the, the reservation, no, not an issue anymore. No, not that I'm aware of. And unless you want to play tennis and a pickleball player has the court reserved, <laughs> then it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, projects that we'll be working on uh, next two quarters, uh, some conference and reservation um, processes. We're working with each department right now to implement that. Find time, which is just an add-on to Outlook that will help us find open, available time for multiple groups, internal and external schedule meetings, uh, and employee directory, branding through the power app um, for our, all of our cell phones that have the contact information. Decisions, which is some agenda management software that right now is specific to um, some meetings that Brennan has, but that's no stand. Um, and then Central Square Learning. Um, Central Square is our financial software. Uh, this learning module has training for um, their product as well as some general like needs and one drive and stuff. So we're going to learn that anyone. And then Routeware, uh, our portion of this is just on the GIS side to add a recycle and garbage route um, with optimized um, routes for efficiency. So our part will be done, but I don't know that Justin will be ready to implement it. So we shall think just because our part is done, we'll, we'll be live with that. Monopool, um, so that's for asset sharing, um, that's for fleet software. We moved our IDR, our interactive voice response system to the cloud. Uh, we're working on online payments um, for most of hotel, our occupancy taxes, so that people can pay online. Mm -hmm. And the second part of SWIFT comply, and then some software upgrades. Uh, we plan to install some more cameras um, at the Wildcat Parks Admin and finish the CNG station in Lions Junction. Uh, Building access, control badge access to human resources, uh, the dice configuration, which we are very familiar with, <laughs> getting rid of our two monitors. Um, then uh, we'll be working with Jana and team to um, come up with a solution for electronic sign up for speaking at, at council. And then staff changes, 
or in our organization chart. Uh, and then for GIS, uh, we had talked in my last presentation about a water outage map. Um, as you all know, we have new management in GIS um, that wants to take that in a little bit different direction. I, I think we may be a little bit more user friendly. So we're, we're revisiting that before we put anything out there to the public. Um, mowing detail dashboard. Um, we've been working on this for a little bit. It's, it's taken us a while to collect all the data and make sure that we have it correct. Um, but we hope to have that available in Q1 or two. And then uh, revitalization map for Tracy kind of had the same same thing, new manager, new ideas, new ways of doing things. So just re-looking at it. And then we're working on our addressing and street naming standards. And we're going to add floodplain data to my government only. Then ongoing projects are niche or management. Uh, construction projects, which I'm sure everybody is very well aware of. Our continued replacement of uh, computers on our cycles. Um, some work on the airport uh, inspections and city works. And then fishing campaign. I love those. Um, as build cleanups for GIS, um, um, data or um, quality reviews for the data that we're um, putting into GIS from CityWorks. Um, obviously, a lot of new collection and cleanup of GIS data is ongoing, and transferring that data from Esri to um, H5 or our Central Square software. And then uh, Mapbooks, we've committed to uh, getting those to the defense team each quarter. And then our KPIs, which look pretty boring. Um, and look, you see the 99.21, it looks horrible, doesn't it? But it's 99.21. <laughs> that's, not, that's not bad. Um, there's Q4. And then I just want to touch real quick about, uh, we've been working with Performance Excellence to update our KPIs and what we report to y'all. So. We're still going to do some availability stuff, but we're going to move towards reporting on some um, um, protection um, percentages with new software that we've implemented, uh, the number of users and devices that we're supporting, and the software. Very much. Good. Thank you. Goodness. How many staff do we have? I have 24. Wow. Still a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know enough to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, this happens every time Kelly gives a report. It's the only person we don't ask questions. <laughs> well, you can talk about one. Then you can ask whatever questions. questions. We don't know what that <laughs> That's the bottom line. <laughs> hey, Brian, I think you're going to for something. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for Kelly while they're pulling that up. <clears throat> On the cameras that monitor the different, uh, like the the wildcat, have you all met, seen any improvement in their presence to, uh, having, as far as crime reduction or vandalism? Or? No, but we've identified locations where they can be added to help with that. Parks is a big, a big area. Okay. Has the wildcat been vandalized? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like <laughs> you haven't had the belt in the Temple football game yet, though. No, <laughs> Jessica, only from Belt. Tiger. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And so, our update for planning and development is we're going to cover uh, the fourth quarter of 22. So July uh, through September, mm -hmm. and then the last three months of the calendar year. And so just looking at uh, our major accomplishments within the last six months, the Bell County MOU for platting, which uh, you all saw several months ago, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be working really well. And uh, we, we don't get too many questions from applicants, but having that um, partnership <laughs> Uh, to review just subdivision plats that really um, only directly impact our city uh, and having Bell County uh, review the others. The Unified Development Code update kickoff, which 
uh, it was about six weeks ago. And uh, so you'll also see in our upcoming next 90 days, uh, we have uh, public input meetings with the consultant, uh, White and Smith LLC out of Kansas City, and then of course, Half Associates, which y'all are familiar with that did our comprehensive plan. Uh, also, Jason Deckman, our senior transportation planner, has been working very closely with communications and marketing uh, to develop mobility minutes, which are on YouTube. I think we're working on getting those on our website, but they're two minute videos with a particular transportation topic. Most recently, it was pedestrian bridges, uh, focusing on the first one was the 31st Street uh, pedestrian bridge mm -hmm. uh, near the animal shelter. Uh, also, tech stop coordination to remove the driveway. And so I'm, I'm going to show you slides for the rest of these. And so here's here's Jason. I'm not going to hear him. That's just a screenshot. But uh, mm -hmm. that is the 31st Street Bridge. And uh, in looking at uh, reporting back to the citizens in terms of grant funding, a lot of these projects. So um, I, I think that's been successful. And also, Councilmember Walker, you're familiar with this driveway, and so we wanted to highlight this uh, because it's uh, coordinating with Textile. And so this was uh, Councilmember Walker. Uh, had a complaint or concern citizen who uh, was looking at this Cadence Bank location, Loop 363, near, um, that is Kirkendall Trail right there. And uh, the point is, so she contacted us, Jason, who we call the TxDOT Whisperer. Uh, and this is just another example of that, just working with TxDOT who is already implementing this change, uh, which will really increase safety for people coming off of the loop and either coming to the bank, I mean, primarily it's coming to the bank uh, so that they're closing that entrance, forcing people to get onto Kirkendall Trail and just a much, much safer access point. So this one, the lower one will be closed. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? No, the, no. no the, lower one, the lower one, uh, I'm sure there are people that are tempted to try to get across yeah. there, but I hopefully not many. No, it's usually it's people it's the, where the X is. Yeah. Yes. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, people yes, flying off the right. road. Yes. Right. Turn quick and get back. So yes. flip their two lanes on the access road mm -hmm. that um, people just fly through, and then you've got people that are coming off the loop and two cars mm -hmm. coming at you. So it, it it you take your life in your hands every time. You do that. So mm -hmm. this will be nice. It'll be paired down to one lane instead of two. Good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Also, uh, another transportation related item. Uh, Jason and, and I were able to go to the American Planning Association State Conference in El Paso in October. Uh, and he gave a, a great presentation along with Jory Daly, the main consultant who was with Alliance Transportation at the time during that 18 month project, uh, but a, a good overview and, and workshop in which, uh, yeah, it was a fairly full house, good combination of engineers and planners and decision makers and, and really an engaging conversation. And really the, the highlight was that uh, this was not something we were planning on doing, but they contacted us three weeks before the, the actual conference and Jason was able to fill in and, and work with the consultant, get up that all together. So even though we weren't planning on that, it was great PR and, uh, and I think went really well. Uh, new art trains within the last six months. Uh, this one at Fox Dog on North 7th Street, just south of the North Central Historic District. Kind of have the Temple Wildflower theme on that train. Precious Memories and uh, that in their downtown location. And that train uh, has different graphics that symbolize all the different businesses that have been in that building over the last hundred years. Jason, I, I mean, no, Brian, sorry, I should know this. Who, who is responsible for painting the different ones? Right, so uh, the, right now, the city, we have uh, 16 different Art trains um, that well, actually, it's twelve. We're, we're 
we're going to ask for four more uh, mm -hmm. budget cycle. But so twelve of we're providing the the trains that that we have. Okay. And they they are responsible. These businesses they apply. Oh, so they go, it goes through a committee process. Mm -hmm. uh, they hire or work with an artist uh, to do that. Finally, they they fund it themselves for the yeah. actual painting. Oh. Is on the committee that decides. Uh, the city staff, okay. various departments, and you know, including great decisions. Public, public works, uh, housing, community development, Main Good. School, led by Main Street. Good. Uh, so Dan Kelleher. So, but They're yeah, all so, so interesting uh, and, and so diverse. And there's a we've got that on uh, our downtown website now. We have got the yep. URL there, which uh, and I should have put a map on there, but either way, um, it has all. Uh, Let's see, eight art trains now as all of those. So looking at our SIS grant, and this was actually an administrative grant uh, issued by Bren for Hat Trick Sports Bar. And of course, this is what the former LM Electronics building there on North Main Street, uh, which didn't really add a whole lot of value to that section of downtown before. Uh, but now the sports bar that uh, Liz mentioned. Um, and her PowerPoint uh, that, yes, that as part of the Main Street, as part of SIS, you know, this has been, so far, it's been there for about a month. Uh, it seems to have good activity and certainly um, generating uh, a, a lot more activity in that part of Northern downtown. We definitely enjoyed ourselves. It, it was really nice. It was very, very full. Uh, it was more kids than I expected. It's yeah. less of a bar and more of a, a soccer right. practice area. And um, it was interesting to see all the dads there. I'm sure they're like, yeah, I'll take them to the birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh. it's what you call a win-win. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do we know what it's called? Hat trip. Yes. I mean, hat, hat trick in uh, soccer and in hockey. Oh. Yes. It's both sports. A hat trick is the same person scoring three goals right. in, a, in a single game. Know the so gentleman yeah. that owns it is also on the Coyotes team. I think it's he's the he's team. the general manager. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so he's very involved in both. Good. Manuel Valasquez, who uh, I think lives in Clean, but he was introduced to Downtown Temple because he's the general manager for our semi-pro soccer team that plays right. at Woodson Field. Yeah, sure. About six games yeah, uh, during Coyotes. the summer every year and. And I uh, was interested in having an indoor training facility, but also a bar. And he's got a food truck, Colombian food truck. So just kind of bringing all of his interest yeah. into a single single business. Well, now he needs to move to Temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Uh, also, that was mentioned in Liz's report for the Torque Preservation Board, the Bird Creek uh, battle, uh, marker relocation, and battlefield preservation which I say major accomplishments in the last 180. Well, it's this is an ongoing process, but began within the last uh, several months. And this is the Willow Glen subdivision uh, along Nugent. Uh, WBW was the developer. The builder is primarily D.R. Horton. Uh, this area here is actually the, the significant uh, part of the battle. The 1839 Texas Rangers versus... Primarily Comanches, but also some Waco and Kickapoo um, Indians. Um, and so there's a battle there that uh, Bird Creek, named after uh, Captain Bird, who, uh, who who died in this conflict. And so it was about 30, 30 Texas Rangers to, depending on the account, um, 200 to 250 um, Indians, and so very significant to Temple's history, to the Texas Ranger history, Comanche local Comanche tribe. So, working with the developer and the builder to take the city tract A, uh, do some battlefield preservation that includes a trail, uh, some interpretive signage, but really the what spurred this on is the relocation of the 1936 Centennial. Uh, granite marker or monument that is in a um, in, in a utility um, a PUE public utility easement just down the street on Nugent that is overgrown. I'm sure y'all have seen that that photo before. So relocating it to here, but also 
expanding the scope to include battlefield preservation, um, which, you know, great private public partnership. Uh, Chuck and Kevin, uh, their staff and, and are uh, going to work on relocating the marker. So it's really been an exciting project because of the collaboration and the excitement about it also happens to be the 200th uh, anniversary of the beginning of the Texas Rangers. And so the Texas Ranger Museum is also involved. So uh, future destination. Who won a battle? Uh, the, the Texans drove them, the Texas Rangers drove them off. Uh, so, you know, it de depends on how you look at it. It was, uh, <laughs> I think uh, five Texas Rangers died, and it was uh, thirty something um, uh, Comanches and Kickapoo and Waco. But um, yeah, so just early Texas Ranger history here in Bell County. Also, the local historic uh, landmark uh, design. Uh, once again, a great collaboration with uh, with communications and marketing. Uh, Kelly, who's doing a great job with the Historic Preservation Board, worked with them and came up with the, this design. Of course, that has been approved and future heritage marker, well, the land, uh, future designated uh, landmarks will have this. Um, and so, of course, the, the heritage marker will, will still continue for what used to be the, the landmark um, uh, design, which you see on current buildings. Okay, looking at the next 90. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about the first six and then I got some slides for the others. Uh, city initiated rezoning south of the BNSF uh, Railroad, Re restarting that process. We've had some, uh, I think, valuable public input from the various businesses already when we were uh, looking at that process and, uh, and ultimately realized we need to have more uh, conversations with them before we were ready to really proceed. And uh, and so that essentially would expand the central area to the south with, with some conditions, most likely, that would allow the existing businesses that be non-conforming, most of them industrial, to continue um, with that issue. Also, the Ferguson Park Neighborhood uh, Planning uh, District overlay, working with Hubby and, and Pillar, their architects, um, you know, and so that process led by Aaron, uh, initiating the historic resource survey process. This would go through the Historic Preservation Board and, and uh, really be initiated by uh, Kelly Atkin Center, our senior neighborhood planner. Uh, expansion of the Development Review Committee process. This is something that has come out of our, our first uh, red tape reduction team meeting, uh, recognizing that there's a need for all zoning cases to, uh, to go at least through staff to be able to identify uh, if there are any infrastructure challenges, you know, the utilities, having the fire marshal take a look at a, a potential development to say, okay, you realize that's a two inch water line, which will not support, um, you know, without uh, replacing the water line to be at least a, a six inch minimum. So just looking at those kind of questions. So it's no additional work on the uh, the applicant's end. It's more of a, hey, we've identified this issue at the zoning stage rather than waiting until platting or permit mm -hmm. uh, and then sharing that feedback earlier rather than later. The UDC update mentioned that hiring a chief building official. So we have uh, three really good candidates uh, that we're interviewing on Friday, March 24th and also uh, Monday the 27th and a variety of, uh, of, of different uh, stakeholders, many uh, TABA representatives are helping with that process. So uh, we're excited about uh, getting that person hired and on board, hopefully. Uh, and then also we talked about the red tape reduction team process. We have our second meeting tomorrow. We're gonna come out zoning, mm -hmm. uh, fun stuff. And, uh, <laughs> And then also just within our department, uh, we have, we've got an award. We've given the first red tape reduction uh, team award to Tanisia Weidermeyer. She was our, our planning technician. Uh, she has, she actually has it for the second time because she's uh, 
She's been doing great things, just improving the process, um, including she's taking the initiative to for us to go paperless, completely paperless, not creating folders that are going to you know sit in more file cabinets. And uh, so that's been that's been a bigger challenge than you might think. Some some of us are uh, you know still committed to paper in in some kind of uh, you know security blanket way. <laughs> Appreciate y'all being proactive with that. I mean, I, I love the name of it. Yes, uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and Bren's leading us on that, and it's it's actually been fun to be able to brainstorm and look at ways to sure. to save everybody time, and uh, and and it it doesn't necessarily mean eliminating all steps. It just might mean put you know putting some of the steps in a different place to make sure that uh, that our applicants are getting the information they need when they need it. Uh, also, May is National Preservation Month, yeah. so we got a lot going on. And there's there's Jason. I, I promised another another photo of, of Jason and uh, some of his photography. So this uh, the Community Treasures program that's part of um, Preservation Month. Uh, Main Street has uh, sponsored this, and I think this this will be the fourth year. And uh, they've had really good submittals for the photos as as they had in the previous uh, three years. Uh, Jason had uh, placed in, in, I think, two of those years, and I assume he'll uh, submit if he hasn't already this time around. Uh, and so those, those winners end up getting displayed at different museums and businesses around town for several months. His silo photograph mm -hmm. is wonderful. Oh, the Jubilee. Yeah. Where, where's Aaron? Is Aaron still here? No. Oh, when when we do the silo district, mm -hmm. we should look at that photograph, maybe for the cover. All right, I'll, I'll talk That's to her. It's a good one. Yeah, I'll talk to her about that. This year, they've also expanded it to include paintings, or actually, I guess it was last year, so second right. year, um, and some really good some medals as well. So that that's exciting. And then also imagine the possibilities tour, and that is going to be May twenty fourth, which is a Wednesday. This year, uh, Liz had mentioned that last year there were 26 different locations that were featured. And you see here, here's the map. Um, not sure how many we'll have this year, but this will be the uh, the, the third year. And uh, and it's the first to uh, represent an expansion from uh, the previous year. So also, this I believe this was the SPJS team professional building and just a setup of what that looks like, you know, it's a before renovation or rehab uh, to have the renderings and just and developers to be able to answer questions, uh, to be able to also market uh, available commercial and uh, residential spaces. And then also on the Historic Preservation Board side, uh, Kelly Atkinson has already hosted or most recently in March 9th uh, preservation workshop. Some of you may have been able to go uh, she's having another one in April, but also one for Preservation Month, and that is going to be Friday, excuse me, Thursday, May 25th. And also in the next 90, uh, I'm working with Dan. Uh, we are going to start on the first Friday in April. Uh, we're going to uh, set up a, a very informal meet and greet with uh, downtown business owners. So. He and I are just going to walk around downtown and set up and say, hey, we're going to be in these different sections, which Dan has put together a map for us, uh, just letting him know, hey, we're going to come and we're going to visit your business and just very informal. We'd like to talk to you, see how you're doing, see what what kind of feedback, what, what can we do for you? So once again, very informal. So something that I did when I was uh, at the city of Alamo Heights, working with a much smaller city. Um, the city manager, we did this and it paid huge dividends in terms of just, you know, building that trust with downtown and really just having uh, just frank conversations with them in terms of what, how they're doing and what they need. Great. Also in the next night, yes. Okay, that's great. I mean, building that relationship is really, sure. really. So we'll just, we're planning on doing it on Friday mornings in Having a couple hours, we may adjust depending on, hey, if it's a restaurant, yeah. they may not be around or open at nine o'clock. So mm -hmm. just, you know, blocking off that period of time. Next 90, the uh, the full 
application for the second phase of the Georgetown Railroad Trail. And that's from 31st Street to the MKT uh, Trust Bridge. Uh, that's a historic structure, National Register of Historic Places. And that, of course, is at the Leon River. That's what it looks like. So that's part of the scope that will apply for, uh, again, but I feel pretty good about this time, uh, for the statewide tech stop funding. It was a good article in the paper. Oh, yes. David uh, yes, very well done. And then also just kind of a, a kudos to Public Works. I don't see any Public Works folks here, but pass on the, the kudos. Uh, so while this isn't a, a, a um, officially a phase of the Georgetown Railroad Trail Project, this is a really significant, uh, I believe this is from today, perhaps, Trust Bridge as part of their drainage project over the Briars Creek Trail at South Temple Park. And I believe that was Richard, you know, Richard Wilson's idea to, as they uh, replace the drainage structure, which is absolutely needed, to, uh, to work on getting a pedestrian bridge as well, which will also um, remove some of the, the funding need for phase one. So that funding can be expanded for the Georgetown Railroad. Project. This matches the bridge across very, Fires Creek at Pat very, Patterson's place. It, what well, it's very oh yes, that, it, it basically matches. I, I haven't. I've street. just seen that one driving by, but I was going to say Thirty First Street Bridge is very similar, but that one is the one. That one yeah, you're talking yeah. about maybe an exact. It may be. And just here's uh, here's the Friars Creek Trail, and you can see that you know they've got the the pylons and and they're that is well under construction. Now, where is that again? This is at the Except, this is at uh, Friars Creek. Right. So, at on, on the, at the Georgetown Railroad. Okay. The Georgetown. At the, okay. Right. Yes. There. Yeah. Um, KPI just focusing on permits right now. Uh, you can see in terms of just combined overall build, building permits, trades permits, you, you name it. Um, in orange is uh, the most recent six months, and then in blue the previous year. That same six month period. And you can see overall, that's a 22% increase. Now looking at January, uh, still a, uh, I believe that's a 21% increase from this year versus last year. So once again, overall permits. Now it's a different story when you look specifically at single family residential building permits. Uh, for a variety of factors, but as as you know, interest rates have been on the rise, and they're finally starting to level off. Clearly, that's impacted mm -hmm. uh, the number of uh, single-family residential permits. But so the dark gray at the bottom uh, is the last six months, and so you can see that it's been lower than the the previous years, especially uh, well, you know, latter months of uh, twenty one were record months and then overall last year was a was a record year as well so lagging behind but once again overall permits are up so we're seeing more renovations where we might have seen a new home constructed uh, people are investing in their current homes and so that's that's a good sign overall uh, looking at inspection numbers very similar to um, to what we were Looking at with permits, as you can imagine, a, a permit uh, in almost all cases generates an inspection. And so comparing this year or, the, or the, these past six months to the previous uh, year's six month period, that represents a 25% increase over the same period last year. And then just looking at inspections in January, uh, comparable January of this year versus last year, and once again, Last year was a record year, and so seeing that uh, that that similar uh, trend of what was it, uh, twenty nine fewer permits, you know, out of almost three thousand, that's pretty much on par for last year. All right, uh, that's all I've got, and happy to answer any questions if we have any time. Any questions? A lot of activity. Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else we need to discuss on our agenda? If not, it is 447 and we'll adjourn the workshop of the city council and convene the meeting of the city council and the council. Thank you.